Jane Burns. I'm a professor at the University of California in San Diego. And this is my colleague. I'm Jane Neuberger. I'm a professor of pediatrics at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. We are here today to share with you a very brief but spectacular update on the Kawasaki Disease International Symposium that has just finished up here in Yokohama, Japan. This was the 12th International KD Symposium. I am going to be speaking about a wrap up and very brief overview of genetics, epidemiology, etiology, immunology, and then I'm going to turn it over to Jane to do treatment, coronary artery outcome, long-term complications. So we'll get started. There were 485 participants at this meeting, representing 32 countries, which was really a remarkable event. It started off with an epidemiology session with the Japanese showcasing their amazing and meticulous epidemiology of cases here in Japan with a couple of interesting features, which was a dip in the number of cases in 2016, but over 15,000 new cases per year with a steadily rising baseline. In contrast, we saw from other countries around the world, but particularly from the United States, that the baseline does not appear to be dramatically increasing. We heard about epidemiology from other countries in East Asia. A lot of the increase that we heard about in India is surely a situation of increased case recognition. We then had uh, discussions about uh, etiology, and I think the most promising and exciting development on the horizon here is actually using genetic engineering methods, molecular methods, to sequence the light chains that appear to be oligoclonal from plasma blasts isolated from Kawasaki, acute Kawasaki disease patients, and working backwards to create synthetic antibodies to try to understand the antigen that triggers this disease. The other approach that was taken was to take antigen antibody complexes and actually dissociate them and try to do microsequencing of the antigen. I think the feeling that we all walked away with from this meeting is that there's a uh, beginning emerging idea that there may be more than one trigger for Kawasaki disease with a final common pathway. I think the mouse models of which we heard extensive presentations also illustrate that point in that there are two main mouse models used for Kawasaki disease. And it may be that they merge at the point of the activation of the inflammasome, the NLRP3 inflammasome, but you can get there by different pathways. We heard a lot about the potential role of the microbiome, the gut microbiome, in influencing the mouse model and whether or not that's going to turn out to be true for the patients, uh, we will have to see. The genetic uh, activity was, was uh, uh, prominent and uh, many researchers talking about different pathways I think we had a brilliant dissection of the FC gamma receptor locus and the influence of polymorphisms in that particular uh, locus uh, in, in the human uh, genome that uh, clearly has an impact on KD susceptibility. There were also presentations without naming the variant uh, that is apparently related to B cells and a lot of work dissecting out private variants in calcium signaling genes, which we all think play a major role in cell activation and the immunology immune response in, in this disease. I think those were really uh, the highlights from my point of view of uh, the topics that were covered in this meeting, obviously many details that we don't have a chance to talk about, but I'm gonna turn it over to Jane now. So I'm gonna cover a little bit about predicting risk treatments and outcomes. Um, in, in this meeting, uh, there were several presentations expanding on risk prediction, which 
historically has been based on uh, simply knowing somebody's routine laboratory data and some clinical features. Uh, here, there were some very interesting uh, uh, presentations on sort of machine learning, computer approaches to discovering who is going to go on and be at risk for coronary aneurysms. There were also uh, uh, many presentations on treatment, and they ranged from uh, simple kinds of case series, which is the way that novel treatment stories begin. For example, use of um, cyclophosphamide and particularly SID recalcitrant patients to phase one, two studies with Anakinra, both in the United States and France, which are very preliminary now in a dose finding. Uh, we went on to hear about um, surveys that show uh, tremendous practice variation. Uh, so within the United States, with 30, uh, a survey of 30 centers in the North American Kawasaki Disease Registry, you saw tremendous practice variation, for example, in secondary therapies for children that didn't respond uh, to the first intravenous gamma globulin infusion. Uh, Audrey Dion presented an abstract uh, that looked at international practices and showed even huger practice variation in all aspects of care, including the use, basic use of intravenous gamma globulin, secondary therapies, those that fail, IVIG, and anticoagulation practices varied by country, by type of physician, uh, by economic circumstances. We looked at um, ongoing and planned randomized trials. Uh, so we heard uh, breaking news uh, of the Atanercept trial, which is a TNF alpha blocker, uh, which showed that overall the results of that uh, uh, trial using Etanercept together with IVIG in so-called primary therapy overall was negative in the sense that uh, the rate of non response was similar overall, but there were some subgroup analyses that suggested efficacy, for example, uh, a better rate of non-response in children over one and in African-Americans, mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, in children over one, some suggestion that you were less likely to have worsening coronary aneurysms. Um, there, there was a lot of discussion about a trial called the HECA trial, which is a primary therapy of, um, of uh, cyclosporin that is ongoing in Japan that has just finished. Uh, and we were brought just to the brink of tantalizing news, but they, they haven't yet released the results. So we're all still waiting for those. Um, we know that there are rescue therapy trials that are ongoing. There is uh, the so-called kid care trial that Jane Burns is the principal investigator of and that is funded by PCORI, which is a randomized study of uh, rescue therapy for children that fail their first IVIG. Uh, and the rescue can either be infliximab or IVIG. And so that trial is ongoing. There was a Japanese trial by Mori et al. that was very small, just 31 patients, that suggested in that study that was very similar, randomized between a second IVIG or infliximab, that your um, rate of uh, continued fever was lower with infliximab. Um, importantly, um, there were post-marketing surveillance for uh, steroids uh, in what's called the RAISE regimen of steroids, which is a tapering dose of prednisolone that's given as primary therapy together with IVIG. And what was fascinating is that in post-marketing surveillance, the rate of aneurysms with that regimen is very similar to what was seen in the trial proper. It was 3% in the trial, rate of aneurysms was 4% in post-marketing surveillance. But fascinatingly, among the patients in post-marketing surveillance who actually didn't get the RAISE regimen, 
the rate of aneurysms was only 5% compared to 13% in the randomized trial. We think that that is because all those patients that weren't getting the proper raised regimen were still getting perhaps even steroids that were slightly delayed from the primary therapy point. Very relevant to the American Heart Association, there was a great deal of discussion about uh, what is happening to adult survivors of Kawasaki disease. We know that in San Diego County, 5% of individuals uh, who present with acute coronary syndromes had Kawasaki disease as their underlying uh, substrate. Uh, in Japan, that number is about 9% of young individuals presenting with acute coronary syndromes have this on the basis of past Kawasaki disease. Uh, we know from uh, techniques like optical coherence tomography that there is tremendous uh, myointerval proliferation in these vessels and that coronary, um, percutaneous coronary intervention can be successful but very challenging and requires a knowledge uh, about how Kawasaki disease coronaries are different from routine atherosclerotic coronary disease. There was uh, a lot of interest in statins and a fascinating uh, set of um, uh, descriptive data showing coronary inflammation before the start of statins, subsiding with statins, and then uh, in one case report of somebody who stopped taking his statins, his coronaries on PET scan became completely inflamed again. Uh, and because of uh, this transition now to adulthood of so many Kawasaki patients, we realize the importance of preparing families and children for independence, uh, making sure they have the right types of insurance, uh, and educating them so they don't get lost. Loss to follow up is a huge problem in Japan, also a problem in the United States. Uh, and finally, we talked a great deal about quality of life uh, and well-being in individuals who had Kawasaki disease. And overall, it was a highly stimulating conference. There were many people from many nations brought together by this topic with a lot of passion, I yeah. would say. Yeah. And we're all looking forward to the, the meetings that will be in October 2021 in Tokyo. Uh, and that will be chaired by Dr. Nakamura uh, and Ayusama. That's October of 2021. So we all look forward to coming together again at that time. Thank you very much. Thank you.